Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Listen Able. That's a nice addition of a new light behind you. Oh, yeah. I'm we- pretty flat. Out. I'm looking a bit dark and gloomy over here. Was that on purpose that I went behind you? It's your aesthetic. You're, you wear mostly dark clothing, and so to brighten up the room and my dull think- personality, we've put a light also, behind Also, I'm probably more tan than you on average. That's fine, yeah. I have very much Irish-English skin and heritage, and if I was to go and get a tan, uh, I'm left with about a 1,000 new freckles. I do have so to I know s- my limitations. I do have to say, you are looking fit, though. Congratulations on finishing your... Running the calendar. So week yes. one, you ran 1K. Mm-hmm. Week 52, you ran 52K. So yeah. 51K. It's pretty tough, mate. Well done. Thank you. 1,378 kilometers That's I awesome. ran last year. And the year before that, in 2022, I ran eight. So it was a bit of an wow. improvement. And that was mostly to the pub. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. yeah. When I was running late. Yeah. Um, yes, it is. it was an amazing challenge. Tears? It was just better to... Uh, no emotional? No. Or like, thank God, it was over. No, I finished with my family down at Manly. So ran from like uh, DY or a bit further past DY down to Manly in Sydney just before Christmas um, or after Christmas. And that was amazing. So that was really cool to celebrate pops from champagne. And it was not the physical aspect of it as much as it was the achievement of just sticking to a goal. That's yeah, what I was really proud of myself for. Especially throughout the Melbourne winter, like when you were clugging around doing 30 k's a week. Yeah. It's pretty yucky weather. You can cop some huge wins. So I had about four runs in torrential rain and sideways wind pushing me back but um yeah got the kilometers up so Good on you, mate. thank you mate. very ironic thing to talk about running on a running podcast on a running podcast on a running podcast <laughs> on a disability podcast with about to speak two people who can't run <laughs> of which i'm one of them yeah that's true so, yeah. well i did just do a leg, leg workout so both of us are struggling on our yeah. legs today <laughs> i thought you were a bit limpy <laughs> um you might have seen something or you're about to see something new next week on the podcast we are launching a bonus so it's gone um we are launching a new segment called listenable moments um these because we've got like nearly 100 episodes of incredible guests and we're having new people join our podcast every single day. Um, What we're doing is going back and highlighting some of our special moments. So key moments from all of our guests will be played in between uh, our new guests. So uh, on the next week's episode, the first listenable moment, um, you're going to hear Prue Stevenson, one of our first episodes and a friend of of ours in real life. Um, She's autistic or is a woman with autism uh, and her story about Dyson hair dryers deserves to be heard again if you haven't. So that's going to be listenable moments in 2024. Hope you enjoyed it on the next episode. It'd be interesting to see whose questions get more um, listenable moments, mine or yours. Let's keep a tally. Okay, cool. Well, I think it's I mean, my question edit. first for Peru. Oh, of course it is. I mean, I you, haven't... you do the edits. To, I mean, Meals, the... Meals, our producer of the stars, she'll have to keep a tally. Meals, please at okay. least give me some questions. Thank you. At the end of the year, we'll see who had the most clicks. Uh, I think you're going to have Chris Blows, who is a, is a great white shark oh, yes. attack survivor. I think you asked the question on the week after. So therefore, Damn right, I do. We'll figure out who plays it. Anyway, we digress. We do have a new guest here today and an incredible guest based up on the Sunshine Coast. Lucky you. Uh, can we please let you introduce yourself to our audience? Hi, I am Brianna Medcalf and I am a disability advocate, a health consumer representative and a law student. And I live with AC1C2 incomplete spinal cord lesion from birth, which basically means that um, I have limited movement from my neck down to my toes. So I think similar to Dylan, but um, a little bit of a higher level injury. So Lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. I was about to say, have you copied me? I also Hmm. have a spinal cord lesion from when I was born. Can you tell us what yours is and how it came about? Yours is a bit higher than mine in the neck, but how did yours come about? I'm always interested to hear because we're very similar. We actually don't really know what happened. Um, I was born and then they diagnosed me with cerebral palsy because my mum wasn't seeing the same milestones that other babies had. So I wasn't moving as much, moving my hands, but I was still very responsive. Um, So yeah, they diagnosed me with cerebral palsy at I think it was five months old. I was just about to go into surgery for a um, hip surgery. And then at three years old, we were seeing a pediatrician here in Sydney. um, So I was born in New Zealand. So we were over on a holiday seeing a pediatrician. He observed me playing on the floor for about an hour and said, I don't think she's got cerebral palsy. I think she's got a spinal cord injury or a spinal cord lesion. Um, And that was just based on the fact that my face and head movement was very normal and I was very responsive in that way. Um, But I had like limited movement in my arms and legs. So um, from that moment, mom and dad kind of started thinking about like, what, what could this have been? And the pediatrician said that it could have been 
some sort of whiplash movement um, in my neck. But um, when they received the report, it didn't actually say that. So we actually don't know. They think it could have happened in utero when my mum was carrying me, but um, it's a bit of a mystery. And then living in New Zealand, coming over to Sydney, it, was it that moment with that paediatrician that connected you so much to, you know, the country that we you now live in and we do as well, that you decided to move over here or was there plans before that or your parents just went, look, you know, these you know, these doctors misdiagnosed you with cerebral palsy. This guy nailed it in an hour. We're going to come and get the care in Australia. No disrespect to New Zealand. I'm asking a question. It was a bit of both. Um, so my parents had lived in Australia previously, but were born in New Zealand. And we'd gone back to live with family for a while. And uh, yeah, so we came over for a holiday, like I said. And I think it was probably mainly down to the medical system. Mum and dad were kind of like, well, yeah, misdiagnosis in New Zealand. Uh, clear diagnosis in Australia and we also had to wait a really long time for an MRI to confirm that um, the spinal cord lesion was the correct diagnosis. So then in that time I think mum and dad and we just decided to move to Australia and the weather, the weather is let's say a lot better than New Zealand, Uh, (laughs) a lot more sunshine here and yeah so we decided we've been living here ever since. You know what they say, New Zealand for rugby, Australia for medicine. (laughs) <laughs> that's, that's that's the new slogan 2024 is. slogan Haven't you guys i have not seen that billboard no that's a big one i also should point out brianna um easy you know brianna's like you know and the weather here fantastic we live in melbourne which is the most unpredictable weather yeah, in the history of the world you live Aucklandish. on the sunshine coast where it is beautiful one day and perfect the next which i believe was a slogan okay um for them a, a part of your backstory which i found really interesting was you know you obviously have had your uh disability from birth, so you know nothing um, but being a chair user. Growing up, though, your mum was your advocate. Uh, When did you decide personally that you were ready to advocate for yourself? And looking back on the job that your mum did, not to be too harsh, she obviously did her best job. How do you feel she best advocated for you? And how do you feel maybe she, or if she did, overstep her mark sometimes and maybe wasn't something that you necessarily needed? Yeah, so I think when I started kind of stepping into the role as an advocate was probably um, and advocating for myself was probably when I transitioned from the pediatric to adult health services um, because it was quite a rocky transition and it was when um, a lot of people around me were also encouraging me to be like more of a voice for myself um, just because as you become an adult obviously you can't rely on your parents for everything anymore Um, so I think It would have been probably when I was between 17 and 18. And that was what pushed me over the edge into like, mum was, yeah, like you said, an amazing advocate from very early age in school was like definitely one of the most important areas where I don't think I would have gotten through school without her amazing advocacy for my physical needs because there wasn't a lot of support in the classroom for people with physical disabilities. So Um, That was really difficult. And then as I got into later high school years, um, she really had to push for more physical support and I eventually got it and it was a real turning point. And, yeah, I think the funniest story that she likes to tell about kind of her advocacy and her way of helping me find my way at school was one of the uh, principals at school was having a conversation with her about my needs and why we weren't getting enough support. And mum was like, well, what else am I supposed to do? Like, I feel like I'm getting nowhere. And the principal was like, oh, why don't you take it to the, I think it was the assistant director of education at the time. And she was like, okay. And so she wrote an email to the assistant director and um, he sorted out everything. And that was when I think I got the most support from then on. And then she went back to the principal and said, oh, um, the principal was like, oh, why'd you do that? And she's like, you told me to. And he's like, I didn't think you'd actually do it. (laughs) Um, So for me, that was like a big, a big moment on, um, you know, I guess a bit of a learning curve on how, um, how far you need to go sometimes and how far is necessary. She hadn't done that previously because she didn't want to overstep the mark, but sometimes it's needed. So 
yeah, I think that was probably her biggest teaching to me. What advice would you give to any youngster with disability in your situation who's listening right now or a parent or of someone who's who's around, you know, end of high school, you're 21 now, is that right? Correct, Brianna? Yeah. Yeah. What, what feedback or advice would you give to someone in your situation that would have maybe made your life easier or something that you could advise to even people that are working in medical fields or schools as well that they could do to, to do better, to be more inclusive? I think definitely recognising um, the needs of the people with physical disabilities. Um, I think in schools, this is what I found with when I was at school, I'm definitely not speaking for the majority, but I found there was a lot of support with um, students with intellectual disabilities and not a lot of support for people with physical disabilities. Um, and obviously with a physical disability, I needed a lot of like personal care assistance as well. So a lot of the support that I did have went towards that. So I think just recognising and seeing the person for who they are and not necessarily putting, like if it's possible, not putting so much weight on quantifiable charts and diagrams and, you know, trying to put a number on that person because that was one of the reasons why we didn't get enough support was because they had a system of um, kind of grading your disability, like how severe it was in different areas. And because I didn't rate very highly, I think this was the old system, I think it's changed now, but because I didn't rate very highly because my intellect, I didn't have an intellectual disability. So I think it's really important for people with disabilities um, and students to feel comfortable advocating for themselves and just to know that they can speak up for them, like speak up and don't be afraid to kind of um, go off and push those buttons where you need to like higher up if you feel like you're not getting anywhere and I think yeah just having the confidence to speak up for your needs really look at what you need where you need it speak up speak up don't be afraid to speak up and don't don't be afraid to go and push those higher buttons if you need to if you're not getting anywhere and then in the health system definitely that whole person approach because that an area that frustrates me is when they look at you in silos and don't see you as a whole person and I think that the whole person approach just makes a huge difference to the life of the person that you're talking to and just yet yeah, remembering all of the facets of their life. Sorry to get deep in the nitty-gritty but what do you mean by whole person approach and what are some of the silos that make the whole person if that makes sense because that works across employment education health whatever there's no cookie cutter approach you and i are both in wheelchairs but we're very different but if people saw us down the street they'll be like they're similar you know what i mean so what do you mean by that and how can people do better around that approach yeah absolutely so the silent approach it's it's a bit of a um I think it's a bit of a health system term, but um, it's where you've got all these, you see all these specialists. So for me, I see a respiratory specialist. I see um, a like rehabilitation specialist and a physio and an OT. And I, a lot of the time these, you see all these people quite separately and you might have, you know, a single health record, but it's so important that they also all talk to each other. Um, and make sure that they're all working towards the same goal and then also talk to you to make sure, or the patient, to make sure that, yeah, you're all working towards the same goal. And like you said, it works in employment and all areas of disability because I think we have so much going on in our lives and to work towards a goal, everyone's got to work together. Everyone in our team's got to work together to make sure that um, we're all working towards the same goal. So yeah in especially just in the health system um i think they have also they look at the number they look at your age they look at i've had an experience where they just looked at my age and sent me to a specific area which wasn't suitable for my needs um because i was an adult well i was classed as an adult for my age but really i'm the size of a pediatric so i think just yeah looking at the person and even just asking them what they need what their needs are because i think we i feel like we can all agree the health system is just getting so busy now that um we all need to remember that there are people on the other end and it's not not all about um the statistics and all about you know the the numbers 
and what, what, what's on paper kind of thing. More than the clipboard at the end of the bed. That's a good little message. Um, do you, did you make that up yourself? You like that one? Do you trademark that? No, That's sure. pretty good. Thank you very much. I should sell that to some Appreciate kind of uni and they can use that. Listen, able merch coming soon. Um, more, 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 more merch. More merch I can't sell. More than a clipboard at the end of your bed on T-shirts. <laughs> like, what the hell? Well, you just got an oh. office full of white T-shirts. If anyone wants to buy them, uh, Listen, able merch is available. Shirts I are $30. I told you I need to get black, bro. You did. Sold out very quick in black. Lots of white left, everyone. Um, you can obviously tell by uh, chatting to you, Brianna, that you're passionate about the medical field, but you did, as you said in your intro, study law or are studying law. Um, I think one thing, a great friend of our shows, personal friend of mine, um, someone I lean into as well for advice is Dinesh, uh, an ex-guest of ours, but just a superstar in all fields. And I think people do forget that he is a lawyer as much as he is a doctor um, at the emergency department on the Gold Coast. Uh, I forget that all the time, personally, yeah. even though I'm friends with him. Yeah, he's a lawyer, <laughs> just yeah, a superstar. Yeah. Um, now, you, how did you reach out to Dinesh? I'm not bringing him up you know, nonchalant. He's, a, I guess, can we say a mentor of yours? And what sort of support and uh, advice has he given you that's helped you with your advocacy and, you know, maybe next steps in your career? He's helped me in so many ways. Um, so I first met him at a spinal convention in Brisbane. He was doing a, a talk, um, like a keynote. And mum was like, we should go up and say hi. And so um, I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And she, we, all, we both went up together and said hi. And um, he was just so lovely, so humble, and kind of just talked to me about what my plans were because at that time I was still at school. And, yeah, he talked to me about what my plans and my life's ambitions were and that from there he gave, like, gave mum and I his contact details and said, if you ever need anything, reach out. And we were down on the Gold Coast, um, and obviously he lives down on the Gold Coast, a few years later, and he'd always said, come visit me if you're ever on the Gold Coast. So we went to visit him, and he um, kind of introduced us to his mum and um, shared a bit about who he is and what he does. And, um, yeah, we just connected that way and then kind of kept in touch since then. And... He's like connected me in the law world, um, going to events and introducing me to people. And I just am in awe of everything that he does. Um, I don't know how he has time to sleep. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, he just, he's connected me with people. He got me into what the Diverse Abilities Network, which is part of um, law, uh, law, Queensland Law Society. And they're a group of, lawyers with diverse abilities and needs and connected me in that way with them so that I could kind of see and have the support as well from people in similar positions and know where I could where I could go in the law world and then also just showing me how to advocate and um, be a voice for others and show the importance of that. So You do a lot of stuff yourself. You're talking about how he doesn't sleep much. We'll get into your horse riding in a bit and things like that. However, what kind of lawyering, lawyered, do you want to do? Where, where do you want to work? What, what do you want to do? Do you want to be an advocate? Do you want to work in um, human rights kind of vibe for people with disability? Do you want to, you know, be a criminal barrister? Where do you want to end up? I originally started my law degree thinking I wanted to be a criminal lawyer. So I did it with uh, criminology. Like I did a double with criminology and then I discovered that I did not like criminology and learning about criminals it was all a bit too much so I just I dropped the criminology side of it um and that's funnily coincidentally when I started going really deep into advocacy um and my advocacy work and I was getting a lot more roles and so I think now I'd really like to go into advocacy law um I have a few different interest areas at the moment I've also done a bit of work experience at a local personal injury law firm which also kind of piqued my interest because it ties in with a little bit with like advocating for people who um, have some, not necessarily disabilities, but have had their um, some disadvantages in that way. So yeah, I, I think advocacy though is really the way that I want to go in work somewhere with advocating for people with disabilities, because that's what I'm really passionate about. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to explore that more as I get to the end of my degree. 
I would have loved if you just went property law. A uh, lot of money in it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I sell myself out at seven hundred and fifty dollars an hour, yeah. and you're like no, advocacy. No, you're like <laughs> divorce law. Just get people cash <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. see the guy again in five years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, keep getting repeat business. Yeah. Um, let's get into horses. <laughs> Dylan did mention it. Um, we had a guest, and Brianna, was that through therapy that you ended up? You know getting into the equine areas or was it, you know, a personal choice that you wanted to, you know, with a lot of land around Mullaney, um, jump into some horse riding? What, what was the inspiration for that? So when I was at school, I was six years old. We decided to go to the Riding for Disabled Open Day, which is a local, um, they have like a local area. It's about 20 minutes, half an hour from us. And we went to the Open Day and we just, it was really cool to see different people with different abilities riding horses that I, I never really had thought about it before and mum was like oh is this something that you'd like to do because they had a session that was called hippotherapy which is like physiotherapy on a horseback so you it's the idea that the horse's movement is kind of mobilizing your hips and building up your core muscles and things like that which is really important when you're spending a lot of time sitting down in a wheelchair so I, and it was also things like reaching for flags, reaching for different items, and just a way, I think, to make um, therapy fun for kids. And yeah, so I got into that. I was really keen. Um, and after the initial assessment, I started riding there and I just absolutely loved it. They had me on a few different horses and yeah, I loved it so much, wanted to keep doing it. And I did that for about probably eight or so years. And then I started, um, my, my coach there was suggested that I do something a little bit more with horses. Um, now that I was getting older, maybe I was growing out of hippotherapy and into more of learning about horse care, horse skills, and uh, yeah, working towards something with horses. So I started learning para dressage, and I've been doing that probably for about eight years now. And I have my own horse, and he lives at the farm there. So it's just an awesome way. I feel like I can go anywhere and do anything when I'm riding a horse. It's, it's, I'm out of my wheelchair and yeah, just very free. It's a very free feeling. So it's just, there's nothing else like it. What, what's your name of your horse? Orion. He's like, I actually, so I'm not, not going to lie. <laughs> it is on my sheet here and I read it as onion and I was so excited. <laughs> Onion the horse. I know, and I was like, he's a horse of many onion. layers. And I was like, what a name! My dog's called Sauce, and I was like, Onion is the best name. And I'm like, oh. And then I reread. I was like, oh, it's not Onion. I was so excited. Uh, Brianna, do you believe, and this has nothing to do with disability, um, that horse owners are at least fifteen to twenty percent more cray cray than the normal populace of the earth? Because that has been my experience in my thirty five years. I definitely. I think there's a few of us cray crows out there. Um, I think just maybe it's the farm air. Do you know how? Do you know how you can tell if someone owns a horse? Because mm -hmm. they tell you. <laughs> That's how. <laughs> It's impossible for them not to tell you that they mm, own good. horses. Oh, that's oh. good stuff. Uh, Brianna, um, you've listened to the podcast and hopefully for people who have listened as well, they know the bowl of uncomfortable returns in 2024. Uh, and this is a segment for those who are new where we ask a question sent in by the public or it's a question that Dylan and I have saved to the end because it might be a little bit edgy ooh, ooh. or personal. Um, my Both of ours have actually come from some of our listeners, so thank you very much. Do you want to go first? Yeah. I do. Ruby, who's 28. Oh, we're getting ages now. Love this. Oh. Do any of your friends leave their bags on your chair on a night out so they don't have to carry them around with them? I love this question. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it is a true that I've become the carry pack horse. <laughs> I I don't mind it actually, to be honest. It means um means I can find them when I need to because they always need their bags. Um, so yeah, it's funny. It's I've, I'm lucky I've got an electric wheelchair, so there's no risk of too pitched. So over oh, over the point. New Year break, I went to a festival beyond the valley, drove there to see a friend of ours, Dom Dollar, do a little surprise set. Yep. And at some point, someone had put Chantel's jumper on the back of my chair. Didn't tell me. She came up four hours later. She's like, "Where the f's my jumper?" I'm like, "What jumper? <laughs> I put it behind you." I was like, "Hey, what am I?" Like, like it's some, your fault. And it was like my fault that I lost it. End up being in my car. Uh. But I was like. Honestly, people put stuff behind us, as in us, as in you and I, Brianna. Sometimes I don't even notice, mm. right? And then they'll be like, hey, mate, what, what happened to that thing? I go, 
What thing? Oh, I put it behind you. What, what am I? Like a walk-in closet? So I'm with you. I'm with you, Brianna. And I also love that you still got a horse reference in there. I'm not a pack horse. Yeah, good. Um, my question comes from Jess in Sorrento. My sweet Sorrento moon. Oh, wow. That was tough. Tina Arena. Who sings that? Tina classic, Arena. Well classic, classic. Um, what's the best and worst thing about being in a chair or being a chair user that's super personal to you specifically? Think about this one. The best, the worst thing is probably for me. It goes beyond my chair. It's more so that like support workers to take me to the bathroom, so personal care and things like that. The most frustrating thing is probably having to plan to go on a night out. I feel like everyone knows that the best nights happen spontaneously. Best night outs. Um, where you just get absolutely smashed and you don't even have a plan of two people with me. So that's probably the hardest thing, the most frustrating thing. I get around it and I've definitely had those spontaneous nights out and I'm super grateful for like my friends and fam who have helped make that happen. The best thing is probably honestly the opportunities that I've had from being a disability. I have, I feel like, like I have a really good relationship myself um, with myself and my disability and I think that's probably because I've always been in my wheelchair and I've always known how to adapt to things so when I was a lot younger I used to be a bit self-conscious about it um, especially when I was at school to, having to do things differently or if we had excursions having to be transferred in different areas and things like that I used to get a bit um not frustrated, but a bit self-conscious about it and that the other kids would be looking at me differently. I've learned to, like, I've, I've always loved, not, not not liked my disability, but I've learned to love it even more, come to discover that it's provided me with so many awesome opportunities to do things like this, um, to, you know, advocate for those whose voices might not be heard as much and, yeah, just be able to do things like that. So I think that's probably my favourite thing about being in a chair and also there is a big perk I'm not sure if I should be saying this but um it's a really good place to hide flasks when you go to festivals Great one. and I was about to ask for a fun one going out on That's night a, out. love it my my, my two they are beautiful <laughs> answers and deep they're my two fun ones easily biggest pain in the ass is getting petrol getting out of my oh, car yeah I've seen you do for that for two seconds to put petrol in mm. Is just such a 15 minute ordeal. It annoys mm-hmm. the shit out of me. When I watch you all just get out or go in and get a coffee, you run in and run out. I'm like, oh, well, I'll be here for 25 minutes. Easily the best, also car related, is car parks. Oh, yeah. I reckon car parks are better than disabled toilets because when you drive around somewhere busy and there's always a car park, mm. it is so good. But then the opposite of that, as you said, personal care is when you have to go to the bathroom and someone's in the disabled toilet. You're in big trouble. So there is a, there is a, they're my favorite too. Well, but getting in places, cutting lines and spring, uh, getting free piss in is all great benefits. I love, love that. that. I've like been able to skip a line at Movie World once and it was the best thing ever. It was such a hot day. We were on a big school excursion and um, there was like probably an hour wait to get on the Superman and I was so excited to go and um they just took us around the front and were like, yeah, you can get straight on. And they offered me another ride as well once it was finished. They were like, do you want to go around again? And I'm like, yes. Wow. <laughs> I used to love a good line skip because of my wheelchair, but the only problem with maybe getting a bit inverted comments famous is oh. people think I'm just doing it because I'm famous now. Ah, and now they think I'm a chair. waker. Still so it cop. actually is the chair. Mm. So when you go to the airport, right, you get to go through first. You don't line up at security because we have the board first, mm-hmm. part of the rules. So when I cut the line, everyone's like, here he is, straight out of the air wanker. In you go, champion. And I'm like, no, it's because I'm disabled. Well, and they still uh, now I'm in trouble. To be fair, you are a wanker. Okay, cool. Um, just to go back to your uh, spontaneity around um, not being able to go out, you know, on a whim most of the time. I don't know this. With with your support workers, if you're, I mean, do you, talking about planning, do you say to your support workers, I don't need help in the morning, mum can help me out or dad can help me out or my friends can help me out in the morning, but I'd love the shift to be 6 p.m. till like 2 a.m. You can book them at the At the wharf bar in, you know, in Malula Bar. Of course you can. And if you do get a support worker, do you pick the one who's like in the corner, like pumping their fists and a bit of fun who's dancing, or do you want them in the corner and not pretend that they're not there because there's boys or girls D- around? Depends if they're cute or not. Do you know what I mean? Give me some answers. What's happening here? I don't know. 
<laughs> so um I yeah definitely you can kind of plan I'm really lucky I think it depends who you have as your support workers or the agency that you go through I'm really lucky that most of my support workers have kind of become um, really close friends of mine from working with me because they work with me like 12 hours a day alternately on different days so um, I kind of have ones and I know which ones love coming out so they're always keen to come out and yeah I love partying with them um, and yeah they're always on the dance floor with me and we just have a great time. I, I kind of love having them with me. Love that. I had no idea. I was like, of course you can get a support worker, but can you book them to 2 a.m.? Apparently you can. That's awesome. Brianna, how do people stalk you? I'm going to do it right now Ooh, yeah. as we're talking. Brianna Medcalf Advocate. Is that what we're rolling with on Insta? Yeah, Brianna underscore Medcalf underscore Advocate. Of course, link below. I'm, uh, I'm going to stalk you right now. There you go. Um, we're following you on this enable. Thank you very much for being on the podcast. We appreciate you. We appreciate your story. And we appreciate appreciate the advocacy work you've done to date and what you're going to continue to do in the future. You're only 21. So much uh, life ahead of you and such great life. So thanks for sharing a little bit of your story. And when I'm up on the Sunshine Coast, which I am very regularly, I'll uh, call you up for a little, you know, wharf session. I was going to say vibes in Malulaba, but that closed down like 10 years ago. Yes, so I absolutely. actually don't know. Yeah, Solbar. 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 Right. Solbar. There you go. See Ocean, you, Ocean Street. Thanks for coming on. Yes, there's a couple of big clubs on Ocean too. Oh, there nice. You Thank you so much for having me. 